Okay. You don't want to go yet. Okay. I'm going to switch screens and read mine. This is called We Can't Talk. <clears throat> it's a little bit long, but don't worry about it. We'll get through it here. We Can't Talk. Mickey walked up the wooden stairs to the elevated train station, steadying himself with the handrail as he went. Don't look down, he told himself, and then gave a short snorting laugh at the dramatic advice. Don't be an idiot was his next thought. It would be very difficult to fall down the steps all the way down to the street. You might slip, but you'd catch yourself. You're not that drunk, just a little buzzed. The worn toe of his black combat boot caught the edge of a step as he neared the top of the staircase and he tripped up the last couple of steps onto the deserted platform. Mickey laughed out loud as he reeled around trying to regain his balance. See, he told himself, you tripped, but you fell down. Or no, you didn't fall down, you tripped up. That made him laugh harder. Tripped up sounds like a, he couldn't think of the word it sounded like. A mortar? A Mennonite? <laughs> no, a Mennonite is a, a church guy thing. He's dynamite. He's The word is mentorite, the meteorite. No, the mental for. That's it. Mental for? The mento metaphor. Mickey plopped down on a bench under a billboard advertising Marlboro cigarettes. He craned his neck around backwards to see the blurry picture of the men on horseback. They had white hats and brown coats, coats with sheepskin lining. He pulled his own sheepskin coat closer around him, wishing his was the real deal, wishing his was warmer. The men on horseback looked warm even in the cold. Mickey leaned back and closed his eyes. He wondered when the train would arrive. On second thought, who cares? He was tired of walking and it was nice to sit on the bench. He noticed there was a heat lamp above him so he got to his feet and shuffled over to turn it on. The lamp buzzed to life, emitting a dim orange glow that brightened slowly as he made his way back to the bench. Mickey sat down heavily again and stretched his legs out straight on the platform in front of him. The heat pulsating down from the lamp felt good. It felt amazing actually. He wished his apartment was that warm. Maybe I'll just sleep here, he thought. He considered that for a moment as he leaned his head back again, closing his eyes. Maybe I could just sleep here. It's late. All the crazies are probably home already. No one will bug me, I bet. I bet? Or, yeah, I bet no one will bug me. The whole platform seemed to be rotating slowly, so he opened his eyes to make it stop. He opened and closed his eyes slowly several times, feeling the rotating slowing down incrementally each time. It was his trick for reducing the spins, as he called the feeling. After a few minutes, the platform still rotated when he closed his eyes, but so slowly he almost didn't notice. Mickey finally opened his eyes again and adjusted his position a little so his rib cage was leaning on the arm rail and his arm was slung over the back of the bench. He felt fairly stable. Now it was just a matter of waiting. Mickey could wait for the train or he could sleep on the platform. It wouldn't be the first time he had slept on a bench all night. He decided if he was still awake when the train arrived, he would take it. Otherwise, the sound of footsteps made Mickey glance over towards the stairway. Someone was coming up the steps to the platform. Mickey didn't adjust his body at all. He just turned his head ever so slightly and then shifted his eyes over to get a better look at the stairs. He wanted to look at who was coming up to the platform without seeming to be looking. From that direction, it would appear as though Mickey were looking straight ahead, which is the impression he was hoping to give. The impression that he didn't care that someone was approaching the platform at 3.30 a.m. on a Saturday night with no one else anywhere in sight or within earshot. A young man about Mickey's age walked onto the platform, bundled in a coat, scarf, and hat. Mickey decided instantly that the young man wasn't dressed at all like the image of a hoodlum he had in his head and relaxed, but kept looking out of the side of his eyes. The young man stopped briefly when he saw Mickey and then went and sat on a bench nearby. Mickey adjusted slightly again so that he could keep the other young man in his peripheral vision. Mickey had terrific peripheral vision. He had perfected this way back in high school in Texas when he was a scrawny kid who got constantly harassed by the jocks. 
He would watch out of the side of his eyes as he got dressed in the locker room after a shower and move out of the way just as a burly football player snapped a towel where his thigh had been. It turned out the jocks thought this game was hilarious and they outdid each other to try and sneak up on Mickey throughout the day. Mickey though, Mickey was good. They called him Slippery Mickey. He got snapped or pushed into a row of lockers in the hallway on occasion, but rarely. And eventually the bullying subsided a bit. Respect, or as close to respect as those bullet-headed numbskulls could muster. And now Mickey used these skills, that peripheral vision, to keep tabs on a stranger on the platform of an elevated train in the middle of the night in Chicago. That's how survival works. The platform was steady now, no more spinning, and he felt tired. His eyes felt tired, and shifting them to the side was a strain. He rubbed the back of his head once or twice and let his gaze drift. He would check in on the other young man occasionally. He didn't seem like a threat to Mickey. He was sitting over on his bench with his hands in his coat pockets, leaning forward, his knees together, looking down at the platform. Mickey hoped the other guy wasn't gonna puke or something over there. Who knows what the sight of someone puking would do to him in this condition. He rarely threw up when he was drunk, but it wasn't fun and he wasn't in the mood to find out if he needed to tonight. Mickey's gaze drifted again and he thought back over his evening. Beer, shooting pool, more beer, cigarettes. He wished he had bought a pack on his way out of the bar, but he didn't feel like paying three bucks for a pack from the machine. He'd get a pack tomorrow for a buck 85 at the discount store. He could go one night without a smoke, probably. Mickey suddenly realized that he had forgotten to check back in with the other young man. At the same time, he realized that the young man was sitting down on the bench next to him. Mickey straightened up and coughed, scraping his legs back into a more upright sitting position. He turned his head slightly in the direction of the other young man and saw that he was holding a small notebook in his hand, offering it to Mickey. Mickey mumbled and waved a hand in his direction and shook his head, but the notebook stayed where it was, hovering just off to Mickey's left. Mickey turned his head to look at the young man, realizing he was actually even younger than he had thought, maybe still a teenager or 20 at most. No thanks, said Mickey brusquely, not smiling. He cleared his throat and waved his hand again, but the young man leaned closer, still offering the notebook. Mickey turned and looked at the young man full in the face, doing his best to look annoyed. The young man smiled at him, a slow, honest smile, and dropped the notebook on the bench next to Mickey. For a moment, Mickey continued to stare at him. He looked vaguely ethnic, possibly Hispanic or Filipino, and was handsome in the way that some young people are. He had an open face and kind, interested eyes. The young man pointed at the notebook and Mickey looked down at where it lay. It was a very small notebook with spiral binding across the top so you could flip the pages up and back. Mickey picked up the notebook and glanced at it. He saw the young man had written the words, why are you sad? in sloppy cursive on the page. Mickey looked back at the young man who was still smiling at him. The young man handed him a pen. I'm not sad, I'm drunk, said Mickey. He hadn't yet decided if he wanted this interaction to last, so he remained unsmiling. Is there something you need? The young man gestured for the notebook and Mickey handed it back. He watched him write, I'm deaf, I can't read lips very well. Please write. Mickey understood, he smiled. Sorry, he wrote, I'm drunk, not sad. Now the young man grinned. I was drunk, he wrote, but I'm not now. My name is Fernando. Drunk tonight, wrote Mickey. Yes, what is your name? Mickey. Why are you drunk, Mickey? Mickey laughed out loud. Beer, he wrote. You? My friend is sick, wrote Fernando. How sick, wrote Mickey, and then wished he hadn't written it. Very sick, might die, wrote Fernando, his face turning serious. Mickey sat looking at the notebook. He didn't know what to write. He felt defensive suddenly. What did this kid want from him? Money? He lived in Chicago plenty long enough to know the score. He looked back at Fernando, who had an open, honest look on his face. He just looked like a kid, but Mickey was still wary. Honesty can be faked with practice. Live around here, asked Mickey. No. Me neither, wrote Mickey, and passed the notebook back. They sat in silence, broken only by the buzzing of the heat lamp above. Mickey reflected that they had already been sitting in silence, but the new silence was clearer, like the cool night sky. Fernando handed the notebook back, and Mickey read, you drunk a lot? Mickey shrugged. I guess, not your business. He felt weird writing something so confrontational, but he felt he had to draw some boundaries. 
He felt he had to let Fernando know that he wasn't taken in by his sick friend and his deaf act. Was he even really deaf? Was this some sort of con? Where do you drink around here, wrote Fernando. Places, wrote Mickey, and all but tossed the notebook back at him. Fernando looked at Mickey, and Mickey felt ashamed. Fernando had a very steady gaze, and Mickey couldn't return it. He put his hands in his pocket and stretched out his legs again, staring at his boots. Fernando scribbled something and held the notebook up for Mickey to see. It said, I don't want anything. I thought we could just talk. His face was devoid of emotion. Not sad, not angry, just a face, like a photograph of someone named Fernando. Mickey looked at Fernando, considering whether to trust him or not. Fuck it, he said out loud after a brief moment and reached for the notebook. We can't talk, he wrote, but we can write. He smiled at Fernando and Fernando smiled back. Nice, Chris. Um, can I ask you just a little bit of questions about that? Sure. Um, when did you when did you write that? How long ago? Uh, about a month ago. Okay. Yeah. How about uh, am I allowed to ask how it was in, what inspired it? <laughs> uh, I was drunk on the train station in Chicago when I was in my twenties, and this guy came up to me and handed me a notebook that said, why are you sad? And we had a very long conversation. I, I wish I had the notebook. I, I kept that little notebook. He gave me the notebook at the end of the conversation, which this was all made up. I don't remember what our conversation was, but I just remember the first thing he wrote was, why are you sad? And I said, I'm not sad, I'm drunk. And then he said, I can't read lips, please write. So, so we wrote. And I, to this day, I don't know if that guy was deaf or not deaf or, you know, I have no idea. It's in Chicago, you, you know, as anywhere, you come up, you come across all kinds of people, you know, but we had an interesting interaction that night. That's always kind of stayed with me. And I had that notebook for years, but I don't have it anymore. So. And what do you think, what made it come back into your mind in terms of what, something you wanted to write about now? I don't Oh, were we? Did we have a, I can't remember why I was writing that. Yeah, it just popped, popped into my head. Back yeah. In my head. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Maybe well, I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you think about him when you're drunk, everyone. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, well that was good. That's a that's a good story. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Anybody have any other questions they want to ask? I I always dominate that. Well. I think that should be the next story is to write what the rest of the missing notebook would have had if yeah. you kept it. Cause I, I'm sure there's a whole nother, there's a whole nother shadow story right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yes, future, future inspiring stories. Well, um, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And, um, Jonathan, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. I've got a, I've got a couple, two different ones, two different songs I was going to share. They're both kind of different. This one's uh, a brand new one. I haven't really done too much, so I may, you may see me scribbling some edits after it's all done, uh, after I perform it, and see if see how it rolls out, if it makes makes sense. But um, just you know, for inspiration, you know, I, I I've said I like to try and test myself just just to write about different things and I thought well I just like to write a song that's sort of like a just kind of an upbeat sort of thing so this one's called uh, a brand new day with you I guess there's more than just one guy who shares the point of view that small talk and small and little things are important things to do I enjoy each mystery, each fresh dream come true. I enjoy the chance to have a brand new day with you. A new day in some small way. The stages like I like them too. In every case, 
each one an ace, each new day with you. Yes, a rose is just a flower, no less, and that's for sure. And truth is the kind of talk that you cannot ignore. Rainbows may leave in dark, calm become a bore. I look forward to being with you one new day more. A new day in some small way will stay like I like them to. In every case, each one an ace, each new day with you. Time will shift as it must do. We all end in the dust. Yet in passing, much is shown to each and all of us. But if I had a cat's nine lives, or endless time in view, the only time that I want is each new day with you. A new day in some small way will stay like I like them to. In every case, each one an ace, each new day with you. So anyway, that's an upbeat song. Very nice. Thanks. Was that, I, I forget, did you say at the beginning what the inspiration was for that? Oh, just, you know, I was just trying to think of, you know, it's it's, it's sort of easy to be inspired by uh, kind of the horrors of the world, either some bad experience or something dramatic or, uh, you know, earth shaking. And I just wanted to write a song about something that was just kind of, uh, happily banal, you know, like just enjoying uh, the company of the people you're with, really. Yes. Yes. I, I try to daily find um, the small joys in, in each in each day. So whatever that may be, you know, just enjoying. They need the to be celebrated, life. each one, you yeah. know, because they're, I mean, that's the real, that's the real stuff. Mm hmm you know, it's a little stuff. So anyway, that was, that was that inspiration for that one. Anyhow. It was lovely. Thanks. Yeah. Do you want to do your other one or do you want to come back to you? Uh, let me come back to it. It's, it's, it's quite a bit different impulse. So maybe I'll just wait and see if, if the mood shifts and it, and it fits in. It, okay. It, it was definitely inspired by all different other kinds of circumstances. So okay. uh, I'll wait. A different, a different mind vibe. Yeah vibe yes 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 all right uh chloe do you want to go next um sure okay um so um yeah like speaking of like taking on a challenge to do something new um in october i actually set myself a challenge to write one small poem for every day of october some ended up being a little less small than others um <laughs> But yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I'm just trying to find like a topic, either like inspired by my own feelings or circumstances, or such as in this case by something else. Um, so this poem I called Persephone, and dear Persephone, please tell me, for I long to know. Did you go willingly into the darkness or were you forced upon its throne? Oh, Persephone, please tell me, for curious I've been, can you miss the chill of winter if you never felt it on your skin? Beloved Persephone, please tell me, as the juice dribbled down your chin, did you think love's sweet taste would be worth all the hurt it begins? Nice. I like that. That was Thank lovely. You. Yeah. I need to brush up on my um, Persephone history because I now have forgotten everything that I assuming that that was in um, speaking to the original 
Persephone as opposed to some other Persephone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, definitely based in um, Greek mythology. Um, and also the fact that there are, there's some like different tellings of the myth. Like some say she was kidnapped by Hades or like married off against her will. Um, some say that, you know, she wanted, she wanted to, she wanted to be there. She wanted to go be queen of the underworld. So, um, and yeah, there's some stories that contradict each other or, or stuff like that, but all of them have in common that when she was sent away to the underworld, her mother Demeter was really sad and caused winter to be caused winter to become a thing basically when she's in the underworld and then when she comes back it's spring again so um whether or not she was forced there I think there was still some pain in that separation and so yeah just kind of a um what's the word musing on on the myth um and what what the truth if there is any true original to it might be nice and did you did you say you had multiple that you wanted to share or no just just the one um, there there are a couple others i could share but we can come back to that okay yeah i think i'm now remembering sylvia had said she had multiple but yes we'll come back around because if you have more i think we have time for it thank you so much chloe okay and that was that was like the whole month of october you said you you won did you continue that that um goal for yourself into other months or was it was it enough um <laughs> to do one and one for each day of october um yeah after those 31 i was a little uh honed out and it was also nanowrimo after that so it was kind of my warm-up to do national novel writing month um but it was a lot of fun and i will definitely do it again okay. yeah cool national novel right wow <laughs> yeah that's really a thing i believe it <laughs> that's cool um well speaking of sylvia would you like to go next sylvia okay um so i've got two little stories um and the first one is uh, and and I, I won't tell them all at once. And they're kind of short, so it's, it'll be all right. But anyway, um, this is a story about being badly behaved on public transportation. Um, since COVID, I can't take any form of public transportation anymore. But I have taken a lot of public transportation in my life because I grew up in San Francisco, where transportation is easy and everywhere, and cars can be a liability. And anyway, I can't drive because of my tricky heart. Well, so I am not always on best behavior. The one time I'm thinking of, I had a toddler and a baby in a stroller, and we had to get to a doctor's appointment, and we were taking the bus, and it was raining. So I was holding the toddler by, the, by one hand. The baby was in the collapsible stroller. And I had a big umbrella that more or less protected all of us when we were walking, but we had to get on the bus. So we're getting on the bus and I'm trying to juggle paying my fare while holding the baby in my arms, trying to keep the toddler from running amok and folding the umbrella down. And then to get somebody to let us have their seat because buses are usually pretty crowded in San Francisco. Finally, I'm sitting on one of those sideways seats up near the front with the baby on my lap and grabbing on for dear life to whatever part of the toddler I could reach. And the stroller was leaning against me and I had put the umbrella on the floor by our feet, but the umbrella wouldn't stay put. And I kept trying to roll out and it kept trying to roll out and trip the other passengers. And I finally gave it a savage kick backwards to get it under the seat. And the lady next to me jumped and screamed, ow! Oh my God, I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so, and she said, what's the matter with you? Do you always go around hitting people with your things like that? That really hurt. You could seriously hurt someone that way. You need to be a little bit more careful and considerate of other people. Is this the kind of example you give your children? 
on and on like that. She just wouldn't stop. I felt so bad for hurting her foot. And I kept trying to apologize, but she wouldn't stop berating me long enough for me to get a word in. Finally, I just got mad. And I leaned over right into her face, keeping the same expression of concern and apology on mine and said very quietly, but firmly, do you want me to do it again? Oh my God, then she really started screaming and the other passengers were looking at her like, what is the matter with this crazy lady? And the bus driver turned around and told her to be quiet or she would have to leave the bus. She shut up. I sat back holding the baby with one arm and the toddler in the stroller with the other and smiled to myself, bad behavior for the win. Oh my goodness. I hope that's a true story. <laughs> oh, I was so expecting that the bad people behaving badly on public transportation to involve somebody other than yourself. But no. <laughs> that's great. Um, do you want to do do you want to do your second story now or come back to you? I don't care. Either one, fine. Uh, let's, let's just keep you, keep you pinned here. All right. So, um, my other story is about the man with the bunny ears. I told you some of this, Christina, on, uh, I think I did on Facebook, didn't I? So I'm a choir gal. For some years, I've been a member of the St. John's Women's Choir, which is another CPAC program like these open mics. And it has been hugely important to me. Standing in that circle, in that room that smelled like cast off children's costumes, looking around at each other's faces and singing, watching each other's body language for the moment of taking a breath, listening for that moment when the harmony is a perfect chord full and bright and we're one thing, one sound. We sang for each other on those rehearsal nights. I miss it so much. It's one of the worst things for me about COVID times. We just can't sing together. We used to sing a few times a year at Assumption Village, the Catholic care facility here in St. John's. It's a marvelous old building. The space where we sang had very high ceilings and there was a balcony halfway down. The audience was facility residents who came and sat in chairs set up for them where we could see, where they could see and hear us. And then there was the man with the bunny ears who was up in the balcony. He wouldn't come down and join us, but he was always there looking over the railing at us with his face in shadow and his large, somewhat shabby gray-brown bunny ears tilting forward into the light. I just admired him so much. I admired him from afar, but one of our people, and I'm not saying it was Liz here, went and talked to him once. He told her he was too shy to come down and sing with us, but loved to hear it. He didn't mention the bunny ears, so she didn't either. We sang for him. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much for I writing. I can attest that's a true story. Thank you so much for writing that and for sharing that. That just brings tears to my eyes. It's just, uh, it's so lovely. Just a nice, uh, just a little snippet and I can totally see it. Um, I, you know, I've been to Assumption Village as well, of course, and I, of course, heard the beautiful music that the women's choir has made. And so it just, wonderful memories and someday we'll get back there. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. I know Audrey will appreciate hearing that too. So I'll make sure to tell her to, to watch it on YouTube where you all should subscribe to our channel. <laughs> um, thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Michelle, would you like to go next? Sure. <laughs> Can I just say too, like that? I, we, I know we mentioned this before, but there's always this 
cool overlap of themes and things that, that there's no plan for that, obviously. But Sylvia, like mine was about a train, yours was about a bus. And then you had a line, we can't sing. You just said, we can't sing. And mine was called, we can't talk. I just think it's interesting how a lot of times we have these subconscious themes that just come up and it comes up all the time, songs and stories, like so many things that we're all seem to be on the same page and we just sort of meet once a month, you know, virtually. I don't know, you you guys might see each other socially more, but, you know, I just think it's interesting. I, I think it's cool that it just is just this really neat overlap of ideas that, that occurs together apart yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway sorry i didn't want to i didn't mean to hijack that i just no, was thanks for noticing it was that. interesting yeah because i yeah i i didn't notice it at first but yeah you're right 100 percent. and it's happened before on multiple mm -hmm. all right michelle it's all you now okay the upstairs neighbor blasts their teen idol music on the hi-fi. Deborah dances back and forth between the table and the kitchen. Sandra in her high chair giggles as she watches her sister leap and twirl and clumsily bump into Gloria each time she pirouettes over to the stove. Gloria is making the usual mushy oatmeal in their run-down first floor brownstone, scolding the girls for being too loud and wishing that her headache would pass. She's thankful for the brick construction that meets most of the pounding coming from the drums. The words of the song leaks through the ceiling in small bits. I want to see you take so long. Gloria adds in the powder, measuring it into each bowl to make sure everyone gets the right amount. Sandra is two. If there's too much, she won't eat. Gloria stirs mechanically to the beat of her headache. The neighbor turns up the music, engulfing the room in noise. Isn't it a pity, isn't it a shame how we take each other without thinking? Deborah attempts a leap, her chubby legs can't deliver. She flails her arms, trying to get her balance, smacking into Sandra's high chair and sending both children flying. The girl's sobs trump the music. Gloria's headache spreads, her temples throbbing, teeth clenched, annoyance radiating. Soon. It has to pass soon. All things must pass. Gloria stuffs Sandra, who is still sniffling from the fall, back into the chair and brings the bowls to the table roughly corralling Deborah to sit next to her. You don't see me crying, says Gloria. I know how sweet life can be, as long as we set ourselves free. She scoops up a lumpy spoonful of oatmeal, hovering it in front of Sandra as she savors the moment of silence. The record ending, the kids quiet in anticipation of being fed. She takes it all as a sign. A sharp knocking at the door shatters the moment. Gloria, needing permanent silence, drops the spoon back into the bowl and shuffles to the door, irritated by the delay. Three young men in dark suits stand on the stoop, holding black books, wearing smiles. The light pours out from behind them, blinding Gloria. Good morning, ma'am. We are terribly sorry for interrupting your day, but we wanted to invite you to our service on Sunday. Are you familiar with the good news of the gospel? A few minutes later, Gloria dumps the uneaten oatmeal into the trash. The neighbor's music descends from above. My sweet Lord. Yes. Now I want to know what your experience is living in a brownstone. None. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ooh, this is a, I mean, not that I know very much about you at all, but, um, when I think of brownstones, I think of New York. I I don't know if they live any if they live if they exist anywhere else. But um, is that Chicago. where yeah. Chicago? Of course, of course. You um, forgot to say the title of your story. Oh yeah, I Gloria yeah. making breakfast in Chicago. Oh nice. Seventy something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, say that again. I just talked over you. No, it's okay. Uh, 1970, I think, is what we decided. Okay. Nice. And, okay, so do you want to share your, your inspiration <laughs> for that? Because <laughs> I want to know. Um, it's a story my aunt told me about my grandma, so I oh. expanded on it. Um, cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much. Are in um, do you, are you a person that writes stories very often? No, 
Nice. I like that you were inspired to do so. Um, in 1970. Gloria making breakfast in 1970. In Chicago. Very important. I'm writing myself notes. <laughs> Thank you. Do you do you feel like uh, that was like a, a one and done, like one story and that's it? Oh, really? You're not going to yeah. write more stories? No. no. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Was it a was it a pretty like painless process? Like, did it just come out pretty easily, or did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah and then I had someone help edit it down, so it was more cohesive. So that was nice. Nice, cool. I'm a huge fan of that story. I think that's an amazing story. That was her first story she's ever written, and I have read it many times. I think it's awesome. Nice, nice work. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad that you trust us with it here, Michelle. You're reading your first story. That's, that's huge. <laughs> so thank you. Um, shall we go? I don't even remember the order that we were in before, but let's, should we go over to Jonathan now? Yes? Sure. That's, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I don't, this one doesn't, I don't know if this one fits a theme really, but, uh, you know, if, if nothing else, a theme fits of like, I, I really appreciate Chloe setting that challenge for herself to write a poem a day. And, and Michelle, I encourage you to set a little challenge for yourself to just write something. I mean, you know, that's just how, how it goes. You gotta just put the challenge out there and go for it. This, this, this song, the song that I'm gonna do, I actually, actually started as a poem uh, that I didn't, think I was going to do anything other than write the poem with. It was kind of inspired by, um, uh, I was think, thinking about a, a friend of ours in, in kind of her, her, her last days, really. And, uh, and so I wrote this, this, uh, I wrote this poem. And then um, a little while back, I kind of dug it out. And I said, Oh, maybe I maybe I can come up with a treatment with music that that'll fit it. Um, it's called, uh, I Lit a Candle for You Alone. I lit a candle for you alone As the day turned dark I watched it until it waned to see the light leave its mark. As I traced the shadow dance, the flickering. tells of all I saw, the glory of high purpose sought, and nature's ruling law, the right to love and all that means, a right none dare withdraw, without awful consequence, the right for those so small. Then I felt a bright light glow In total paradox The candle and the day were past But light flooded in my thoughts A brilliance born of noble truth That lives beyond time's locks That good will last as element beyond history that for God. I lit a candle for you alone as the day turned dark. I watched it till it waned.
so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That was lovely. Hmm. Unfortunately, my internet got a little funky, so the recording might be weird, but we got I got most of it. I don't I'm assuming it's it the recording goes through my computer, and so I apologize that there might be a little moment of frozen screen, but it's only a moment. <laughs> I you know, I, I don't rely on this for for uh for for all documentation at all. I'm just doing this because it's fun and good. good stuff. Anything that gets saved is gravy. So yeah. yeah. Well, I want to go back and listen to it. So that's part of my my lamenting, lamentation. I I would also send you another version of it if you want. So if if, if you really want, I mean, I you know, sure. the whole point for me to do this is like I've got all this thing, stuff sitting around, and I have yet to find a venue where to put it out into the air any place. So it's it's really quite available. Yes. Needless well, to say, yeah. Please, yes. If you if you have a recording or if you want to make a recording, I'd love to hear it for sure. sure. Um, Chloe, did you want to share again? Um, sorry, I was trying to find something. Um, so if anyone else wants to share something else real quick, they can do that. Or I have, I do have something else ready to go. Okay, because you were thinking you wanted to do the, the other thing that you're looking for instead. Yeah. Okay. Chris, did you have more that you wanted to share today? No, I I know my first one is kind of long. I think that's that's good for one <laughs> night. You've had your quota. Yeah. You're, out. you're <laughs> done. Cut them off. <laughs> Anybody else? I think it's all you, Chloe. But okay. we, can, we can wait. I mean, we can like, you know, talk about random stuff while you're still looking. You <laughs> no, I have no idea if I'll actually be able to find it. So I will just go with the one I- Leave it for to... next month. Next Yeah, month. yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> this one fits into my own theme, I guess, because I did write about other things over the month of October, but this is another Greek mythology sort of inspired one. Um, and it is titled Medusa. Whether or not you think it connects to the myth at all, that, that's up to you, but um, <laughs> here it is. You tried to burn me, but my own fire was hotter. You tried to drown me, but I learned to breathe underwater. You tried to stab me, but I was wearing armor. You tried to poison me, but my own venom was stronger. You tried to turn me into a monster, but I held up a mirror. Nice. I like that. Power. And I have a lot of feelings about the myth of Medusa and how she is a lot of times turned into like basically the vision of a monster who turns people to stone but you know none of it was actually her fault she she was raped in a temple and then was cursed for it so yeah that's uh that's my take on on kind of that whole message there I guess and that, ha that happens to a lot of girls in Greek mythology. It's yeah, they they're raped and then they're, you know, viciously punished for having been raped. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think you know, in Medusa's case, they're like, oh, she was turned into a monster, but actually, she was given the ability to protect herself. Yeah, um, and I think that is also kind of telling of current women's issues sometimes like we are either victims or monsters for defending ourselves and yeah yeah i've got to say reading greek myths and people other people who are reinterpreting myths are just to me just such a fascinating way to explore all kinds of really like human experience that's still current still contemporary i mean there's there's you know there's analogies that are that are really 
you know, glaring even so, so after all this time. So I, I find them just really great, uh, fertile ground for, for sort of stimulating, uh, imagination too. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a lot of power in reclaiming some of those stories also and reframing them in, in certain ways, whether or not it's true to the original source is, you know, up for debate, but there's power in claiming it and they're folk tales that everybody ultimately owns. So you, you have free license, I figure. Yeah. <laughs> Chloe, have you read um, a book called Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis? It's, it's, it, you probably have heard of C.S. Lewis. He's more, he, people, you know, think of him more as like a kind of a Christian religious writer. But he wrote this book called Till We Have Faces, which is the retelling of um, Cupid and Psyche, the, the, um the greek myth of cupid and psyche and uh i i read it like 30 years ago and it's it's basically a novel um it just popped into my head when you were um i i remember enjoying it but again i was like 20 you know um i don't remember a lot of <laughs> what it was but i think it's really interesting when people take something like a a myth kind of like um jonathan was saying about you know, you, you retell it and then, especially in the form of a novel, you know, you get, you, you really pick it apart and get all those details and go into, you know, cause the, cause when I, you know, when you read the Greek myths, they're usually pretty short, you know, although the, although characters pop up over time and there's story after story after story, you know, these, of these different mythological people. Um, but anyway, it just, I thought it was interesting. And he wasn't really known for, you know, I don't think delving into, although he was, I think he was like an Oxford professor or something. Um, so maybe, but anyway, I'll stop talking about it, but it was, <laughs> look it up, see if you, see what you think. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. I wrote it down. Always, always good. Always interested in new, new books to read. <laughs> And I'll make my own judgment about whether it's a, a good book or not. <laughs> from, from Chris's 20, 20 year old self's recommendation, I'll keep that in mind. No, I, I'm sure that you had um, interesting taste in, in uh, literature when you were in your 20s. No offense to anybody in their 20s. I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway. <laughs> so, so my rambling is getting contagious i, I think. know what's what going on let me clarify hang on like i just <laughs> oh goodness well um thank you all thank you all for for your sharing and for being here and um and for the interesting conversation um we will be back here on february 19th i believe it is the third saturday of the month so we'll be back um hopefully you'll be able to join us again um as you know we always greatly appreciate um donations if you're able to give them let's see if i can get this link right here uh -huh. there it is i did it Liz, I think, was going to try and beat me to it. Oh, if you look back up in the chat, though, um, <clears throat> uh, Liz did post the, the link to our YouTube channel. So eventually, if we have, I believe, if we get enough subscribers, we can have like our own, not a whole bunch of random letters and numbers, but like maybe it would say something like Cathedral Park Arts. As <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I could just be like wishful thinking, but... Um, <clears throat> to get to our channel, I guess. I, I was going to ask what the benefit of everybody subscribing is. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no longer very close to twenty, so I don't understand any of the implications <laughs> of any of that. So, uh, if subscribing helps uh, promote the cause, I I'll think do it, it so. does. I get the feeling that it gets it out there more and and lets people know about us and about what we do and that sort of thing. Oh, but um, 
the social media person might know more specifically about that. We just give us a thumbs up if that's a true statement. The more, yeah, the more you subscribe. Oh, she's she's more on like Instagram, Facebook kind of world. So, but I believe that's true. That yes, the the more subscribers, the more visual it gets. Um, and then for those of you who are in Portland, we do we have some classes that have started and some that are. Um, starting so if you know folks who might be interested in terms of our adult classes we have guitar and ukulele class that's starting um, next Friday and then um, improv for life has started but there's still room to join and that meets on Mondays um, we are taking off this Monday for in honor of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday um, but then the following Monday, which I believe is the 24th, um, we'll be back. Um, and so that would be only the second class. So if you're, if you're, if you're feeling like you want to try some improv in your life, and I wish that part of me wishes it could be for in, online people too, but it just, we're, we're going for in person. Um, I have decided to join it this term, um, and I'm really excited. Um, Tony is our instructor, and he is great. Oh, hi. Welcome back. Um, and that our, our registration is... Do, 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 do. Oops, if I can spell right. <laughs> this is going to try to beat me, but she's not going to do it. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> um, and I think that's all I have to share with you today about business kinds of things. I say again, thank you, thank you. If, it, if you weren't here, once again, I would just be hanging out with Charlie um, on the screen by myself, um, hoping that somebody would tell me a story. Thank you for telling me stories tonight. And I love it. And um, be well, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you back in a month. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Christina. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was wonderful. Nice to see you all. Bye. Hey, Christina. Yes. I have a just a quick little question for you before you log off.